Welcome to Reading Aloud, a broadcast series presented as our recognition of an old family custom. I'm Bill Cappis. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens has been, since 1843, an inseparable part of the celebration of the Yuletide season throughout the English-speaking world. Indeed, the name Scrooge has passed into the language to describe an ill-conditioned, cross-grained miser, and Tiny Tim's God Bless Us Everyone has sounded forth at countless thousands of Christmas dinner tables. For this special reading, we'll hear all the major scenes of this classic, beginning with a sketch of Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head and on his eyebrows and on his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, no wintry weather chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he, no falling snow was more intent upon its purpose, no pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him only in one respect— they often came down handsomely, and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming on would tug their owners into doorways and up courts, and then would wag their tails as though they said, No eye at all is better than an evil eye, dear master. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance was what the knowing ones call nuts to Scrooge. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting-house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy withal, and he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. It had not been light all day, and candles were flaring in the windows of the neighboring offices like ruddy smears upon the palpable brown air. The fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole and was so dense without that although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. To see the dingy cloud come drooping down, obscuring everything, one might have thought that nature lived hard by and was brewing on a large scale. The door of Scrooge's counting-house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. 
but he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. A merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you, cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Bah, said Scrooge. Humbug. He had so heated himself with rapid walking in the fog and frost, this nephew of Scrooge's, that he was all in a glow, his face was ruddy and handsome, his eyes sparkled, and his breath smoked again. Christmas a humbug, Uncle, said Scrooge's nephew. You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do, said Scrooge. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come, then, returned the nephew gaily. What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Scrooge, having no better answer ready on the spur of the moment, said, Bah! again, and followed it up with humbug. Don't be cross, uncle, said the nephew. What else can I be, returned the uncle, when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas, out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older, but not an hour richer. A time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a round dozen of mouths presented dead against you. If I could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, pleaded the nephew. Nephew, returned the uncle sternly, Keep Christmas in your own way, and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, repeated Scrooge's nephew, but you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then, said Scrooge. Much good may it do you, much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, returned the nephew. Christmas among the rest, but I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time when it has come round, Apart from the veneration due to its sacred name and origin, if anything belonging to it can be apart from that, as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good, and will do me good, and I say God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Becoming immediately sensible of the impropriety, he poked the fire and extinguished the last frail spark for ever. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge. And you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see him. Yes, indeed he did. He went the whole length of the expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first. But why? cried Scrooge's nephew. Why? Why did you get married? said Scrooge. Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if that were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Nay, uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon. Said Scrooge. I want nothing from you. I, I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. 
I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party. But I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humour to the last. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. His nephew left the room without an angry look notwithstanding. He stopped at the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. "'There's another fellow,' muttered Scrooge, who overheard him. "'My clerk, with fifteen shillings a week and a wife and family, talking about a merry Christmas, I'll retire to Bedlam.' This lunatic, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands, and bowed to him. "'Scrooge and Marley's, I believe,' said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. "'Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley?' Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago this very night. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner, said the gentleman presenting his credentials. It certainly was, for they had been two kindred spirits. At the ominous word liberality, Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. At this festival season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? asked Scrooge. Plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down the pen again. And the union workhouses, demanded Scrooge, are they still in operation? They are still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigour then, said Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you said at first. You... Uh, something had occurred to stop them in their useful course, said Scrooge. I am very glad to hear of it. Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, returned the gentleman, a few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is the time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing, Scrooge replied. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough and those who are badly off must go there. And they can't go there, and Manny would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. But you might know it, observed the gentleman. It's not my business, Scrooge returned. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentlemen withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labours with an improved opinion of himself and in a more facetious temper than was usual with him. At home that night, Scrooge is visited by the ghost of his late partner, Marley, and then, on the stroke of one, by the spirits of Christmas past, present, and future. 
The first of these conjures up scenes of his childhood. Then the ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it? said Scrooge. Was I apprenticed there? They went in. At sight of an old gentleman in a welch wig sitting behind such a high desk that if he had been two inches taller he must have knocked his head against the ceiling, Scrooge cried out in great excitement, Why, why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again! Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself from his shoes to the organ of benevolence, and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice, You there, Ebenezer! Speak! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow prentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Ah, poor Dick, dear, dear. Yo ho, my boys, said Fezziwig. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up, cried old Fezziwig with a sharp clap of his hands, before a man can say Jack Robinson. You wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters, one, two, three, had em up in their places, four, five, six, barred em and pinned em, seven, eight, nine, and came back before you could have got to twelve, panting like racehorses. Hey, ho cried old Fezziwig, skipping down from the high desk with wonderful agility. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Highly woo, Dick. Chin up, Ebenezer. Clear away. There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away, or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off as if it were dismissed from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped upon the fire and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend the milkman. In came the boy from over the way who was suspected of not having bored enough from his master trying to hide himself behind the girl from next door, but one who was proved to have had her ears pulled by her mistress. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. In they all came, and they how and every how. Away they all went, twenty couple at once, hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping, old top couple always turning up in the wrong place, new top couple starting off again as soon as they got there, all top couples at last, and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, "'Well done!' and the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter especially provided for that purpose. But scorning rest upon his reappearance, he instantly began again, though there were no dancers yet, as if the other fiddler had been carried home exhausted on a shutter, 
and he were a brand new man resolved to beat him out of sight or perish. There were more dancers, and there were forfeits, and more dancers, and there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was another great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled, when the fiddler, an artful dog mind, the sort of man who knew his business better than you or I could have told him it, struck up Sir Roger de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. Top couple, too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them. Three or four and twenty pair of partners. People who were not to be trifled with. People who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if they had been twice as many, ah, four times, old Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. If that's not high praise, tell me higher and I'll use it. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance like moons, you couldn't have predicted at any given time what would have become of them next. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, both hands to your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle and back again to your place, Fezziwig cut, cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs and came upon his feet again without a stagger. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two prentices, they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away and the lads were left to their beds which were under a counter in the back shop. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene, and with his former self. He corroborated everything, remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent the strangest agitation. It was not until now, when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, that he remembered the ghost and became conscious that it was looking full upon him, while the light upon its head burnt very clear. A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small, echoed Scrooge. The spirit signed to him to listen to the two apprentices who, who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwig, and when he had done so, said, Why, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four, perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that, said Scrooge, heated by the remark, and speaking unconsciously, like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it costs a fortune." He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What is the matter? asked the ghost. Eh, nothing particular, said Scrooge. Something, I think, the ghost insisted. Eh, no, said Scrooge. No, I, I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. His former self turned down the lamps as he gave utterance to the wish, and Scrooge and the ghost again stood side by side in the open air.
Ebenezer Scrooge is next visited by the ghost of Christmas present, who reveals contrasting scenes, leaving the miser more and more shaken. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate or the town, and yet was there an air of cheerfulness abroad that the clearest summer air and brightest summer sun might have endeavoured to diffuse in vain. For the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from the parapets, and now and then exchanging a facetious snowball, better-natured missile far than many a wordy jest, laughing heartily if it went right, and not less heartily if it went wrong. The poulterers' shops were still half open, and the fruiterers were radiant in their glory. There were great, round, pot-bellied baskets of chestnuts, shaped like the waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen lolling at the doors and tumbling out into the street in their apoplectic opulence. There were ruddy, brown-faced, broad-girst Spanish onions shining in the fatness of their growth like Spanish friars, and winking from their shelves in wanton slyness at the girls as they went by, and glancing demurely up at the hung-up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in the blooming pyramids. There were bunches of grapes made in the shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from conspicuous hooks that people's mouths might water gratis as they passed. There were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks among the woods, and pleasant shufflings ankle-deep through withered leaves. There were Norfolk biffins, squab and swarthy, setting off the yellow of the oranges and lemons, and in the great compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. The very gold and silver fish set forth among these choice fruits in a bowl, though members of a dull and stagnant-blooded race appeared to know that there was something going on. And two of fish went gasping round and round their little world in slow and passionless excitement. The grocers, ah, oh, the grocers, nearly closed, with perhaps two shutters down, or one, but through those gaps such glimpses, it was not alone that the scales descending on the counter made a merry sound, or that the twine and roller parted company so briskly, or that the canisters were rattled up and down like juggling tricks, or even that the blended scents of tea and coffee were so grateful to the nose, or even that the raisins were so plentiful and rare, the almonds so extremely white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, the other spices so delicious, the candied fruits so caked and spotted with molten sugar as to make the coldest lookers-on feel faint and subsequently bilious. Nor was it that the figs were moist and pulpy, or that the French plums blushed in modest tartness from their highly decorated boxes, or that everything was good to eat and in its Christmas dress. But the customers were all so hurried and so eager in the hopeful promise of the day, that they tumbled up against each other at the door, crashing their wicker baskets wildly, and left their purchases upon the counter, and came running back to fetch them, and committed hundreds of the like mistakes in the best humour possible, while the grocer and his people were so frank and fresh that the polished hearts with which they fastened their aprons behind might have been their own, worn outside for general inspection, and for Christmas doors to peck at if they chose." But soon the steeples called good people all to church and chapel, and away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes and with their gayest faces. And at the same time there emerged from scores of by-streets, lanes, and nameless turnings innumerable people carrying their dinners to the baker's shops. The sight of these poor revellers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in a baker's doorway, and taking off the covers as their bearers passed, sprinkled incense on their dinners from his torch. And it was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice when there were angry words between some dinner-carriers who had jostled each other, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humour was restored directly, 
or they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day, and so it was, God love it, so it was. In time the bells ceased, and the bakers were shut up, and yet there was a genial shadowing forth of all those dinners, and the progress of their cooking in the thawed blotch of wet above each baker's oven, where the pavement smoked as if its stones were cooking too. "'Is there a peculiar flavour in what you sprinkle from your torch?' asked Scrooge. "'There is. My own.' "'Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day?' asked Scrooge. "'To any kindly given, to a poor one most.' "'Why to a poor one most?' asked Scrooge. "'Because it needs it most.' And perhaps it was the pleasure the good spirit had in showing off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous heart in nature and his sympathy with all poor men that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks. For there he went and took Scrooge with him, holding to his robe. And on the threshold of the door the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinkling of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons which are cheap and make a good de show for sixpence, and she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons. While Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property conferred upon his son and heir in honour of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find him so, so gallantly attired, and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own, and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. "'Whatever has got your precious father, then?' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'And your brother, Tiny Tim. "'And Martha warn't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour.' "'Here's Martha, Mother,' said a girl, appearing as she spoke. "'Here's Martha, Mother! Hurrah!' cried the two young Cratchits. "'Hurrah! Such a goose, Martha!' "'Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are,' said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off a shawl and bonnet for her with officious zeal. "'We'd a deal of work to finish up last night,' replied the girl, "'and had to clear away this morning, mother.' "'Well, never mind, so long as you are come,' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'Sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm, Lord bless you.' "'No, no, there's father coming.' cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide! So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch, and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. "'Why, where's our Martha?' cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. "'Not coming,' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'Not coming,' said Bob, with a sudden declension in his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church and had come home rampant. "'Not coming upon Christmas Day.' Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, even if it were only a joke. So she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash-house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. "'And how did little Tim behave?' asked Mrs. Cratchit, 
and she had rallied Bob on his credulity, and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool before the fire. And while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, and stirred it round and round, and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon to which a black swan was a matter of course. And in truth it was something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy ready beforehand in a little saucepan hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour, Miss Belinda sweetened up the apple sauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and, mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, the grace was said, it was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all round the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness, were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate at all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witnesses, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the back yard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hallo! A great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other with a laundress's next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, and blazing in half of half a quartern of ignited brandy, and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding! Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been flat heresy to do so. Annie Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. 
At last the dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept and the fire made up. The compound and the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half a one. And at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks, while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and cracked noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, every one, said Danny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his little withered hand in his, as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side, and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge, with an interest he had never felt before, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh, no, kind spirit, say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it, and decrease the serpent's population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit, and was overcome with penitence and grief. The ghost of Christmas yet to come shows Scrooge the contrast between death mourned by a loving family and the end of life alone and unlamented. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment like a wing and withdrawing it revealed a room by daylight where a mother and her children were. She was expecting someone, and with anxious eagerness, for she walked up and down the room, started at every sound, looked out from the window, glanced at the clock, tried but in vain to work with her needle, and could hardly bear the voices of the children in their play. At length the long-expected knock was heard. She hurried to the door and met her husband, a man whose face was careworn and depressed, though he was young. There was a remarkable expression in it now, a kind of serious delight of which he felt ashamed, and which he struggled to repress. He sat down to the dinner that had been hoarding for him by the fire, and when she asked him faintly what news, which was not until after a long silence, he appeared embarrassed how to answer. Is it good? she said, or oh, bad, to help him. Bad, they answered. We are quite ruined. No, there is hope yet, Caroline. If, if he relents, she said, amazed, there is. Nothing is past hope if such a miracle has happened. He is past relenting, said her husband. He is dead. She was a mild and patient creature if her face spoke truth, but she was thankful in her soul to hear it, and she said so with clasped hands. She prayed forgiveness the next moment, and was sorry, but the first was the emotion of her heart. What the half-drunken woman, whom I told you of last night, said to me, when I tried to see him and obtain a week's delay, and what I thought was a mere excuse to avoid me, turns out to have been quite true. 
He was not only very ill, but dying then. To whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know. But before that time we shall be ready with the money, and even though we were not, it would be a bad fortune indeed to find so merciless a creditor and his successor. We may sleep tonight with light hearts, Caroline. Yes, soften it as they would, their hearts were lighter. The children's faces, hushed and clustered round to hear what they so little understood, were brighter, and it was a happier house for this man's death. The only emotion that the ghost could show him caused by the event was one of pleasure. Let me see some tenderness connected with the death, said Scrooge, or that dark chamber spirit which we left just now will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him through several streets familiar to his feet, and as they went along, Scrooge looked here and there to find himself, but nowhere was he to be seen. They entered poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner, and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in sewing, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard those words? He had not dreamed them. The boy must have read them out as he and the spirit crossed the threshold. Why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The, 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 the collar hurts my eyes, she said. The collar? Ah, poor tiny Tim. They're better now again, said Cratchit's wife. It, it makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used these last few evenings, Mother. They were very quiet again. At last, she said, and in a steady, cheerful voice that only faltered once, I have known him walk with... I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. And so have I, cried Peter, often... And so have I, exclaimed another. So had all. But he was very light to carry, she resumed, intent upon her work, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble, no trouble. And there is your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him, and little Bob in his comforter, he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they all tried who should help him to it most. Then the two young Cratchits got upon his knees and laid each child a little cheek against his face, as if they said, Don't mind it, father. Don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. They would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You went today then, Robert? said his wife. Yes, my dear, returned Bob. I, I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little child. <laughs> my little, little child. He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been farther apart, perhaps, than they were. He left the room and went upstairs into the room above, which was lighted cheerfully and hung with Christmas. There was a chair set close beside the child, and there were signs of someone having been there lately. Poor Bob sat down in it, and when he had thought a little and composed himself, 
He kissed the little face. He was reconciled to what had happened and went down again quite happy. They drew about the fire and talked. The girls and mother working still. Bob told them of the extraordinary kindness of Mr. Scrooge's nephew, whom he had secretly seen but once, and who, meeting him in the street that day, and seeing that he looked a little... just, just a little down, you know, said Bob, inquired what had happened to distress him. On which, said Bob, for he is the pleasantest spoken gentleman you ever heard, I told him. I am heartily sorry for it, Mr. Cratchit, he said, and heartily sorry for your good wife. By the by, how he ever knew that, I don't know. Knew what, my dear? Why, that you're a good wife, replied Bob. Everybody knows that, said Peter. Very well observed, my boy, cried Bob. I hope they do. Heartily sorry, he said, for your good wife. If I can be of service to you in any way, he said, giving me his card, that's where I live. Pray come to me. Now, it wasn't, cried Bob, for the sake of anything he might be able to do for us, so much as for his kind way, that this was quite delightful. It really seemed as if he had known our tiny Tim and felt with us. I'm sure he's a good soul, said Mrs. Cratchit. You would be surer of it, my dear, returned Bob, if you saw and spoke to him. I shouldn't be at all surprised. Mark what I say, if he got Peter a better situation. Only hear that, Peter, said Mrs. Cratchit. And then, cried one of the girls, Peter will be keeping company with someone and setting up for himself. Get along with you, retorted Peter, grinning. It's just as likely as not, said Bob, one of these days, so there's plenty of time for that, my dear. But however and whenever we part from one another, I am sure we shall none of us forget poor tiny Tim, shall we, for this first parting that there was amongst us. Never, father, cried they all. And I know, said Bob, I know, my dears, that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was a little, little child, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves and forget poor Tiny Tim in doing it. No, never, father, they all cried again. I am very happy, said little Bob. I am very happy. Mrs. Cratchit kissed him. His daughters kissed him. The two young Cratchits kissed him. And Peter and himself shook hands. Spirit of tiny Tim, thy childish essence was from God. Spectre, said Scrooge, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him as before, though at a different time, he thought. Indeed, there seemed no order in these latter visions, save that they were in the future, into the resorts of business men, but showed him not himself. Indeed, the spirit did not stay for anything, but went straight on as to the end just now desired, until besought by Scrooge to tarry for a moment. This court said Scrooge, through which we hurry now is where my place of occupation is and has been for a length of time. I see the house. Let me behold where I shall be in days to come. The spirit stopped. The hand was pointed elsewhere. The house is yonder, Scrooge exclaimed. Why do you point away? The inexorable finger underwent no change. Scrooge hastened to the window of his office and looked in. It was an office still, but not his. The furniture was not the same, and the figure in the chair was not himself. 
the phantom pointed as before. He joined it once again, and wondering why and whither he had gone, accompanied the spirit until they reached an iron gate. He paused to look round before entering. A churchyard? Here then the wretched man whose name he had now to learn lay underneath the ground. It was a worthy place, walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds, the growth of vegetation's death, not life, choked up with too much burying, fat with repleted appetite, a worthy place. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. He advanced towards it, trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded that he saw new meaning in its solemn shape. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, said Scrooge, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead, said Scrooge. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. "'Am I that man who lay upon the bed?' he cried upon his knees. The finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. "'No, spirit, oh, no, no!' The finger was still there. "'Spirit!' he cried, tight clutching at its robe. "'Hear me! I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been but for this intercourse. Why, show me this if I am past all hope!' For the first time the hand appeared to shake. "'Good spirit,' he pursued, as down upon the ground he fell before it, "'your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life.' The kind hand trembled. "'I will honour Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year.' I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me that I may sponge away the writing on this stone. In his agony he caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and detained it. The spirit, stronger yet, repulsed him. Holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own, the room was his own, Best and happiest of all the time before him was his own to make amends in. I will live in the past, the present, and the future, Scrooge repeated as he scrambled out of bed. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and the Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. He was so fluttered and so glowing with his good intentions that his broken voice would scarcely answer to his call. He had been sobbing violently in his conflict with the spirit, and his face was wet with tears. "'They are not torn down,' cried Scrooge, folding one of his bed curtains in his arms. "'They are not torn down, rings and all. They are here. I am here. The shadows of the things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be. I know they will.' 
His hands were busy with his garments all this time, turning them inside out, putting them on upside down, tearing them, mislaying them, making them parties to every kind of extravagance. I, I don't know what to do, cried Scrooge, laughing and crying in the same breath and making a perfect laocoon of himself with his stockings. I am as light as a feather, I am as happy as an angel, I am as merry as a schoolboy, I am as giddy as a drunken man. A merry Christmas to everybody, a happy new year to all the world. Hello, here, whoop, hello! He had frisked into the sitting-room, and was now standing there perfectly winded. "'There's the saucepan that the gruel was in,' cried Scrooge, starting off again and going round the fireplace. "'There's the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered. "'There's the corner where the ghost of Christmas present sat. "'There's the window where I saw the wandering spirits. "'It's all true, it's all true, it all happened. Ha, ha, ha!' "'Really, for a man who had been out of practice for so many years, "'it was a splendid laugh, a most illustrious laugh.' the father of a long, long line of brilliant laughs. I, I don't know what day of the month it is, said Scrooge. I, I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I, I don't know anything. I'm quite a baby. And if mind, I don't care. I'd rather be a baby. Hello, whoop, hello there. He was checked in his transports by the churches, ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Clash, clang, hammer, ding, dong, bell, bell, dong, ding, hammer, clang, clash. Oh, glorious, glorious. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, clear, bright, jovial, stirring, cold, cold, piping for the blood to dance to, golden sunlight, heavenly sky, sweet, fresh air, merry bells. Oh, glorious, glorious. "'What's today?' cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes, who perhaps had loitered in to look about him. "'Eh?' returned the boy, with all his might of wonder. "'What's today, my fine fellow?' said Scrooge. "'Today?' replied the boy. "'What Christmas Day?' "'It's Christmas Day,' said Scrooge to himself. "'I haven't missed it.' The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do anything they like. Of course they can. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello, returned the boy. Do you know the poulter is in the next street but one at the corner? Scrooge inquired. I should hope I did, replied the lad. An intelligent boy, said Scrooge. A remarkable boy. Hey, do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. "'What, the one as big as me?' returned the boy. "'What a delightful boy,' said Scrooge. "'It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck.' "'It's hanging there now,' replied the boy. "'Is it?' said Scrooge. "'Go and buy it.' "'Walker!' exclaimed the boy. "'No, no,' said Scrooge. "'I am in earnest. "'Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here, "'that I may give them the direction where to take it. "'Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling.' Come back with him in less than five minutes, and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. He must have had a steady hand at a trigger who could have got a shot off half so fast. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's, whispered Scrooge, rubbing his hands and splitting with a laugh. He shan't know who sends it. <laughs> it's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's will be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did, somehow, and went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. As he stood there, waiting his arrival, the knocker caught his eye. Ah, I shall love it as long as I live, cried Scrooge, patting it with his hand. I scarcely ever looked at it before, but an honest expression it has in its face. It's a wonderful knocker. Eh, here's the turkey. Hello, whoop, how are you? Merry Christmas. It was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped them short off in a minute like sticks of sealing wax. Why, it's impossible to carry that to Camden Town, said Scrooge. You must have a cab. The chuckle with which he said this, and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey, 
and the chuckle with which he paid for the cab, and the chuckle with which he recompensed the boy were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down breathless in his chair again, and chuckled till he cried. Shaving was not an easy task, for his hand continued to shake very much, and shaving requires attention even when you don't dance while you are at it. But if he had cut the end of his nose off, he would have put a piece of sticking plaster over it and been quite satisfied. He dressed himself all in his best, and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present, and walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word that three or four good-humoured fellows said, Good morning, sir, and Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards that of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, those were the blithest in his ears. He had not gone far when, coming on towards him, he beheld the portly gentleman who had walked into his counting-house the day before, and said, Scrooge and Barley's, I believe. It sent a pang across his heart to think how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met. But he knew what path lay straight before him, and he took it. My dear sir, said Scrooge, quickening his pace, and taking the old gentleman by both his hands, how do you do? I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, said Scrooge. That is my name, and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness? Here Scrooge whispered in his ear. Lord, bless me, cried the gentleman, as if his breath were taken away. My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you please, said Scrooge, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me that favour? My dear sir, said the other, shaking hands with him, I don't know what to say to such munif— Don't say anything, please, retorted Scrooge. Come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will, cried the old gentleman, and it was clear he meant to do it. Thank ye, said Scrooge. I am much obliged to you. I thank you fifty times. Bless you. He went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head and questioned beggars and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up to the windows and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that anything could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon he turned his steps toward his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but he made a dash and did it. "'Is your master at home, my dear?' said Scrooge to the girl. "'Nice girl, very.' "'Yes, sir.' "'Where is he, my love?' said Scrooge. "'He's in the dining-room, sir, along with mistress. "'I'll show you upstairs, if you please.' "'Thank you. He knows me,' said Scrooge, with his hand already in the dining-room lock. "'I'll go in here, my dear.' "'He turned it gently and sidled his face in round the door. They were looking at the table, which was spread out in great array, for these young housekeepers are always nervous on such points, and like to see that everything is right. Uh, Fred? said Scrooge. Dear heart alive, how his niece by marriage started. Scrooge had forgotten for the moment about her sitting in the corner with the footstool, or he wouldn't have done it on any account. Why, bless my soul, said Fred. Who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I, I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in. It is a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. 
So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. He was full eighteen minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. His hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter, too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I'm very sorry, sir, said Bob. I am behind my time. You are, repeated Scrooge. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It only once a year, sir, pleaded Bob, appearing from the tank. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now I'll tell you what, my friend, said Scrooge. I am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, he continued leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again, and therefore I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down with it, holding him and calling to the people in the court for help and a straight waistcoat. A merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge, with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family, and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. Make up the fires and buy another cold scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town or borough, in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh, and little heeded them, for he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good, at which some people did not have their fill of laughter at the outset. And knowing that such as these would be blind anyway, he thought it quite as well that they should wrinkle up, up their eyes in grins, as have the malady in less attractive forms. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him, that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, every one. Scenes from A Christmas Carol, the 1843 classic by Charles Dickens, part of the series Reading Aloud, heard on WGBH Radio since 1958. Engineer for this production, Melanie Burzon, Bill Kavner speaking, and a Merry Christmas to you.